Good morning. Good morning. So um, <clears throat> this is part two uh, of um, experiences with God. Actually, uh, maybe the best thing is we just share our experiences. Uh, because um, I think I, last time I asked, you know, who experienced God this morning or this week or last month? And um, different people answer. But um, do we sh actually share with each other how we experience God? Because I think it could really help. We can help each other. Yeah. I mean, some people have very dramatic experiences. For example, people who have a near-death experience, and they, they experience the overwhelming love of God. And it transforms their life. Maybe some of you have had some uh, very strong experience. But in our daily life, how do we experience God? Are we experiencing God? Do we feel distant from God? Do we have a living relationship with God? So, um, you know, for us in the first generation, we, we've been part of this uh, movement for 40 years at least. And for you younger people, all your life, you know, you've been kind of exposed to um, a life of faith. The question is, during those years, have you established a relationship with God? like a daily relationship, and what, what is that like? And uh, your parents, have they been able to pass on their life of faith and how they experience God? So um, that's why I chose this topic. I, th I think this is one of the fundamental topics. You know, how do we relate to God? Do we, how do we experience God each day of our lives, because, each moment? Because that's, we should be experiencing God the whole time. So what's, what stops us? What blocks us? Um, so, um, I can press the right thing here. Which do I, can I press this? Okay, that's it, good. So what does uh, a mother, our true mother say about this? So I, uh, this uh, little quote I, I used last time, she says, religion must first teach the truth about God. I do not mean simply that God exists. I mean, teaching about our relationship with God. True religion teaches the nature of God, the reality of God's love, and how to live in that love. So to believe in God is not enough. But we have to have, we need a relationship, and we need to understand, well, what is God's nature? If we think God is a all-powerful, you know, a God of judgment, our relationship to God would be very much like a servant, uh, afraid of God because God might, uh, you know, strike us down. If we think that God is universal intelligence, then we don't see any emotion there. We don't see any a personal, like a, a personal God with any, with any personality. So I think the divine principle is giving us insights into the nature of God, which helps us to know about God's love and about how to live in that love. So these three aspects I would like to look into. First of all, if I ask you, from your understanding, can you describe God? What would you say? What words would you use to describe God's nature? Parental. Parental. Parental love. Anything else? Omnipresent. Omnipresent. Best your best friend. <laughs> Anything else? Peaceful. Peaceful. Okay. So I'd like to isolate uh, certain points for these three. Um, we understand God is a God of heart and love, not just a God of love. In Christianity, God is a God of love, yes. But God is a God of heart because love comes from that heart. And uh, also we, understand, we can understand God is a God of heart because he created us in his image. So that's how we understand by looking at creation, the patterns of creation, we're the highest creation. And we have a heart, but that heart is not just a heart that is always loving, gushing with love. We can feel pain. So we understand God is not just a joyful God that just um, gives out love, but God can feel pain, which is very different. So this idea that, you know, oh, you know, God allows all this suffering in the world, you know, there can't be God. But if we understand that God suffers because of the suffering he says, it's a very different way of looking at things. 
And um, I would like to, uh, I, uh, when I was reading the Mother of Peace book, I've been trying to understand more about heart because the understanding is that heart is like this impulse to love an object, to be united in love with the object of love. But the question is, what, what makes the impulse? What, what causes that impulse to, to come out? And then I discovered something new by reading Mother's book. Because when I read, so I miss things, then I read again and I catch something. And this is what I caught. So heart, this is what she says, for which my husband coined the Korean word shimjong, is the essence of beauty and original root of love. Two things. Essence of beauty. You know, if you say someone has a beautiful heart, because the heart is beautiful, it's the essence. The essence is like the, the very nature of beauty is in the heart. And it's the original root, the root of love. This is where love comes from. So if you see these three pictures, you can see beauty in them. And she says this, it is beauty that stimulates love to surge forth eternally. So it's actually the beauty, seeing the beauty in the object, seeing the beauty in the flower, in the child, in the dog. When you see that beauty, it stimulates this love to come out. Because we understand that if you don't have an object, like, you know, Father, when he talks about God's nature, he says that um, God is a God of love, but actually it's kind of remaining dormant unless that love can be expressed because love requires a relationship. And so this is what I, I realized that God is, heart is not just where love comes from, but heart is where beauty resides. Yes? But when you have someone to love, then the, uh, uh, you see that something beautiful. So if I see your faces, and if I can see you with God's eyes, and I see the beauty in you, my love for you comes out. So this is God's nature. And also we understand that God is both masculine and feminine. Again, we learn from the principle because there's this like um, two aspects in all of creation. And we're the highest. So God is masculine and feminine. And from that, we understand God is a heavenly parent. So he has a heart of love, but he, God is both a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. And this is what the principle teaches. And so now we're coming into the age of women because we need balance. Yeah. God's, how could God, God's heart be happy if men dominate the world? <laughs> and women, the, the feminine aspect of God cannot be expressed. Okay, so if we, the way we understand God has a huge impact on our relationship to God. That's why we need to understand God. <laughs> if we want a relationship to God, if we understand that he's actually my parent and I'm his child. Therefore, if you are a parent and I'm a parent, when I see beauty in the, 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 the way my child behaves, it brings out this love for them. So God looks at us and he sees the beauty in us, even if we do very bad things. So how, even if we, are, we feel far from God, God's love is always there because he sees the beauty, because he created us in his image. He sees our beauty, so he cannot help but love us. But if we don't feel God's love, how difficult that is for God. He wants us to feel his love and we, we don't feel it. We don't, and then we say, well, there is no God. So God's situation, the heart, the heart suffers in that sense. And me as a parent, if my children show this filial piety, my heart is moved. If they don't, I feel something is missing. Yeah? What about the reality of God's love? If I ask you what, I mean, I've already explained a bit about love, but it's, you know, love exists in a relationship. Of course, I can look in the mirror and I can say I love myself and uh, because I can see God in myself or, you know, what God created, but it needs to be activated and it is parental love. Parental love, these three things, unconditional. There's, there's no conditions. God will love us no matter what. Parents love no matter what. Sacrificial parents like my daughter Lisa and my uh, son-in-law uh, Phil are experiencing very much sacrificial love 
you know, not sleeping at night. And uh, uh, the, the focus of their whole life is completely changed. But that's God's heart. That's how you grow. Yeah. And it's like in the family, this is where we experience God's love through all the different relationships. And actually, I, I yeah. So and then uh, love is unchanging. It will never change. And eternal. Forever. So this is parental love. And the family is the school of love. So we experience God's love in the family. So how do we live in that love? This is the third thing. How do we live in this love? So I came up with two things. We need to open our heart to God's love. If we think there is no God and God allows suffering, or then our heart is closed. If we feel hurt by something, the, the person wasn't nice to me and our heart closes. If we're too intellectual, too much in our head, our heart isn't open, it's harder to feel God. And then the other thing is to live for the sake of others, because when you live for the sake of others, which is true love, when you're giving for others, you receive a lot back, because this is God's nature. God's nature is to give. Yeah, You don't lose, you gain. So if we want to experience, have a relationship to, to God and experience God, we need to open our hearts. This is the internal aspect of us, and we need to uh, live for the sake of others. This is the external aspect. We need both. So just to meditate and to pray all night long is not enough. You can open your heart, but then if you just sit there and say, God, I, I feel love, it's wonderful, and then you don't do anything for others, what's the point? Because God's love needs to be expressed. So when we serve others, we, we give a hug to someone, we, we give a, uh, like a, a kind word, we appreciate someone. This, we feel loved, yes? But we have to give it. Okay, so... Last time, I uh, used this book by Ron Papalado, Experiences with God, Stories About Mystics, a guidebook to your own divine encounter. Now, I was surprised that he's a controversial figure. But actually, my attitude is, can I learn from somebody? Maybe his views are different from yours or mine. But... I think he's a very sincere person, and I think he, is, he wrote this book because of his own experiences. So what can I learn from him? So this is my attitude. There are many people in the world I may not agree with, but can I learn something from them? So I want to review uh, some of the, the things he, uh, that are in this book. So he, has, he talks about how to meet God. And first he says, he talks about the power of your heart activating your connection with God and overcoming barriers to God's love. So I'm going to briefly review that. And then I'm going to go on to the topic of forgiveness to experience God's love. So first of all, the power of your heart. According to science, the heart is the most powerful generator of electromagnetic energy in the human body, much stronger than the brain. It is actually, in reality, it is the master organ. And this electromagnetic energy reaches out in like maybe a, a meter beyond us. No, 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 three meters, three meters. So that's why we can pick up the energy of somebody else, because their heart energy is kind of radiating outwards. But the heart is also the most powerful tool we possess for contacting God. So this is where God resides. And... If we read from Mother's book, there are certain things she says which confirms this. She says, your heavenly parent who loves you resides deep in your heart, deep in your heart. If your heart is closed, how can you experience God? You have to open your heart because it's deep inside. God planted his heart inside of you. But we live a very external life. And we're very busy, and do, but we don't pause and try to tune into our heart. Then how can we feel God? Secondly, she says, you are designed to hear God's true voice. God designed us. It's not something special for certain people. Every single one of us, we are designed by God. We have this heart, which if we're open, we are, God, God can speak to us. 
She says, your heart is your closest teacher. In the face of difficulty or confusion, ask your heart. Ask your heart, your closest teacher. And also she says, we all need to hone our ability to hear the true voice of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother in our hearts. To hone means to tune in, to tune in, yes? So how do we tune in? You, know, you, have, you tune in different channels on a radio. We need to tune in to God's channel. How do we do that? How do we activate it, open our heart? Positive emotions raise the vibration of our heart. If we achieve a state of calmness and patience, cultivating gratitude for the many simple things in life, our heart begins to vibrate on the same wavelength as God, and we can start experiencing communication. So it's a certain wavelength, a certain vibration that we have to tune into. God is always there. God is dwelling in our heart. God is not up there, out there, far away. God dwells in us. But we have to get into the same vibration. Tune in. So that's why we pray. When you pray, you open your heart. You share with God. I mean, I suppose heartfelt prayer. Sometimes it's very hard to pray. I can say the words, but I don't feel it in my heart. But so if we can pray from our heart. Because it opens up. We're talking to God. And also meditate. Meditation is when you stop your thinking. If you stop your thinking, then you're more in touch with your heart. Maybe you need to do both. I mean, you know, meditate, calm your mind down, and then open your heart. Oh. Of course, studying God's word is also, it opens your mind and your heart, because those words are coming from God. <laughs> so God's words are on a certain vibration, and they stimulate your mind and your heart. So that's why studying continuously is very important. There are a lot of false words around us, yeah, but we need God's word to tune in to God's heart. And if we're in nature, nature, God designed nature so we can feel joy. It opens our heart. Sweden is a wonderful example of beautiful nature, especially in the summer, but of course, a true Swede would love every single season, especially winter, yeah? <laughs> because it's pure. Yeah. So it, this opens up our heart, tunes us into God's um, nature. And we sing and listen to uplifting music. So that's why we sing before we, there is a sermon. <laughs> Singing opens up your heart. And also if you listen to uplifting music, it's moving. Mm. Yeah. And, um, if you watch inspiring movies, sometimes I, after watching an inspiring movie, I feel very moved. It's like, wow, you know, I especially like movies about some person who overcomes, you know, great difficulties and they achieve it. And then I feel I'm with them. I'm feeling their feelings and they succeed. And I feel really high. So there are many practical ways you could say in our daily life to open up our hearts and to activate, like raise our vibration and activate connection to God. But of course, this is more the internal work. Yes? Opening our heart to God, God's love. But the external, to live for the sake of others. We need to practice that. We activate a connection God by God by the way we live. So, for example, Anne-Marie doing all the, um, the food this morning. Yeah, you know, that activates her connection to God. And I think Valtrad was making a cake. It's great, you know. Yeah. So when we do things for others, it raises our vibration because this is God's way of life. Secondly, overcoming barriers to God's love. So, unworthy. Of course, if I ask you, do you ever feel unworthy? You may say, no, I'm fine, you know, I'm fine. But actually, I think the truth is all of us, to some extent, we're infected with this feeling of I'm not good enough. You know, I'm sinful or I'm got God is, you know, I'm not worthy for God or I've got all kinds of problems. I'm not worthy. And I, that creates a separation. The idea that God is up there and I am here, this is ridiculous because God is inside of us, but we are blocking God because I don't feel, I don't feel worthy for God to be with me. But God is inside your heart wanting to come out but I, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. So 
We have to be willing to let go of the false belief that we are not worthy of God's love. We are all God's children created in the image and likeness of God. It is our birthright to claim God's love. It's a false belief that we're not worthy. It's our thinking, our feelings that convince us we're not worth it. And if we don't feel God, it's, that's, you could say that's justification for saying I'm, I'm not really worthy because I'm, I'm too far away from God. Unconditional love of God, it doesn't matter, you know, the worst people in the world, <laughs> like our enemy, God loves. That is God's way to love your enemy. That's what Jesus did. That's what true parents have done. Yeah. Even in your own family, maybe a family member is a bit like your enemy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but we have to love. We have to love. So these are all kind of um, negative emotions. Uh, I don't know. One of them is certainly anger. Another one looks like shock or one looks very confused or one maybe is crying. I don't know. But negative emotions are a barrier to experiencing God's love. Anger, jealousy or resentment don't vibrate on the same wavelength as God's love. It is our individual responsibility to create positive emotions and raise our vibration. But if you're angry, if you feel jealous or resentment because of what someone said or did to you, it's very hard to get rid of that pain. If you're hurt, little children, you know, they may cry and then the next moment they're fine. But us adults, if something, if somebody says something like a hard word or upsets us, it's very hard to get rid of. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know. Rela human relationships are difficult because we misunderstand. Uh, we 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 lack the capacity to um, to kind of understand or embrace that person because we have limitations. It's true. It's true. We are. But to say we're unworthy is not true. We are very much worthy. But again, it's our own thinking and our emotions which block us. How can we experience God's love if we have resentment, or we're jealous, or we're angry? So now we come to forgiveness, because this is how a very big factor in overcoming this barrier to God's love, the power of letting go. When you have a conflict with somebody or something hurts you and you feel angry, can you let it go? Because that's what forgiveness involves, to let it go. Don't live in the past. Don't regret the past. Don't feel, oh, I'm a failure because of the past. You look at us. We are unificationists. When I joined, we were told you need to find three spiritual children. How many people did that? Any of you managed that? Maybe you did many more. I think most members, members have not been successful at all <laughs> at doing this. So we can say, yeah, I'm so unworthy. You know, I'm so far away from God. Um, so it's very easy to kind of be, we have to forgive ourselves, yeah? Not, not dwell upon what we didn't do and what's wrong. If you look at your own family, maybe things have not turned out the way you had hoped. Do we dwell upon that? Do we feel, I, I made a mistake, I did something wrong, and I can't forgive this person, and I can't forgive myself, I failed. We have to let the past go, because God doesn't dwell in the past. God dwells in the present. God dwells only exists in the present. <laughs> yeah. So if I ask you, what is the definition of forgiveness? Would anyone like to offer? What do we mean when we say forgiveness, to forgive someone? I've talked about letting go, but there is a dictionary definition. What does it mean to forgive? Any ideas? I'm sure you have ideas, but if you don't speak, I will reveal to you. <laughs> Forgiveness means to stop feeling angry and resentful towards someone because of their behavior or mistake. So we've all done bad things, regrettable things. We made mistakes. Yeah. And the person may feel resentful towards, angry towards us. If they can't forgive us, that's very difficult. But the other way around, if someone has done bad things, and I, I can think of people who've done bad things to me, in the past, do I still feel angry? Do I still feel resentful? 
Can I stop this feeling? So how do we do that? Of course, one, one way is through a parental heart, and I will come to that later. Without forgiveness, life is governed by an endless cycle of resentment and retaliation. You can see this in the whole of human history. You can see it happening in the world today. We have to forgive what others have done wrong. If we want to experience God, if we can't forgive someone, that's why that's a barrier to feeling God within our own heart, because it closes our heart. There is no love without forgiveness, and there is no forgiveness without love. They go together. God forgives us eternally. You know the story of the prodigal son? The son comes back. back. He's done very many bad things. His brother's resentful <laughs> because his father embraces him and, and has a big party, a celebration, because that love is unconditional. This parental love, God's love. So how do we forgive others? <clears throat> of course, I mentioned a bit about parental heart and not living in the past. But um, what does mother say? Our mother and our father are probably the best example of how to forgive because they've been persecuted throughout their life, misunderstood, even in our own movement, even their own children. Terrible. Yeah. So what does she say? God needed a man and a woman who could endure suffering and rejection while continuing to forgive and love all people, thus revealing God's heart of parental love. This quote, before this, she talks about how Korea, God chose Korea and chose the only begotten son and the only begotten daughter because they were needed to go through this, that they could reveal God's heart by enduring suffering and rejection, but just to forgive. This has been their path. That's why they are the greatest people on this earth or in spirit world because of their capacity to forgive in, in, in enduring this suffering. Mother knew and father knew that once they took on this mission, they would suffer. They would be rejected. But by forgiving those who accuse them and by loving all people, then they could overcome completely and reveal God's heart of parental love. In the same way, Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He revealed a parental love. So she says this, my husband once saved the life of a Japanese prison guard who had severely tortured him. The torture took place in the police station in Gongi province at the, uh, oh, anyway, Korea, South Korea should be, of the, during the Japanese colonial rule. When Korea was liberated in 1945, this policeman could not find a way to return to Japan. He went into hiding, but some Koreans found him and were intent on killing him. The policeman, Commander Hara, was only hours away from death when my husband heard of the plot. He took it upon himself to free Mr. Hara and get him on a small boat heading out the country in the middle of the night. He was tortured. Father was tortured by this man. But when this man was in danger of losing his life, what did father do? He saved him. He forgave him. If you were tortured by anybody, the trauma you would feel for years and years and years, could you forgive? All those people who went to spirit world, like in Africa, for example, or under communism, you know, uh, when they go to spirit world, they're traumatized. And they can't, they can't move on. So that's why mother did these ceremonies to liberate them. Liberate them from their resentment. Yeah. So this policeman, he, he, he knew he'd done wrong. His conscience told him. But father liberated him. He showed him the ultimate love. Father has been in prison six times. Three occasions he was tortured. On one occasion he was thrown out as if dead. But still, he forgave. And what do we see? He said, she says this, the capacity to forgive our enemy and save his or her life does not appear overnight. It requires 
that we eliminate the resentment and anger in our hearts and see God in the face of our enemy. To see God in the face of our enemy, how difficult that is. But that's what true parents have done. So, here are two enemies of father. Because father was an anti-communist and we're against communism because it denies God and it has caused the death of millions of people. But what did he do? He went, in 1990, he went to Russia, a communist country, and he met with President Gorbachev and his wife. And he didn't say, oh, you know, uh, um, he spoke out strongly about, you know, you've got to turn to God. <laughs> and the same when he met Kim Il-sung in North Korea in 1991. He embraced him. He offered, you know, money to help build a car factory and uh, to really love, like Jacob embraced his brother Esau. This is what father did. The two enemy countries, the most powerful communist countries in the world, he met the leader and basically he embraced them. He forgave them. He looked in the eye of Kim Il-sung and he forgave him. Incredible. I mean, when he went there, and he went to, to Moscow with mother. He didn't know if he would live. <laughs> he could have been locked up. He could have been killed. But his love, feeling God's love in his heart and his ability to forgive, he demonstrated the ultimate, the ultimate kind of um, standard of, of parental love. Now I'm going to show you another picture. This is father. This is this mug shot when he was sent to Danbury Prison on July the 20th, 1984. My husband was found guilty of owing a total of $7,300 in taxes and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. People, first of all, I mean, they, these people investigating our movement were trying to find something to pin blame and to accuse. And they found over a three year period through mistakes of these Japanese members, that seven, oh, just over $7,000 uh, had not been um, uh, you know, given. The, the, the tax was not paid. Normally, you just pay a fine. But this was not for father. They wanted to stop him from actually coming back to the country. He was in Korea at the time, but he came back because he was innocent. But he was imprisoned for, what, for uh, 18 months. Can you imagine? This was the sixth time in a democratic country he was put in prison. A feeling of deep darkness descended as we watched Father Moon enter the prison. He was embarking upon an unfair prison term in a foreign land, and I knew that I had to forgive the people who had put him there. It was our opportunity to practice our movement's most fundamental ethic, love your enemies, live for their sake. To forgive and love those who accuse and deceive is what we came to call the Danbury spirit. The Danbury spirit is to give and give even after everything has been taken away. To forgive those involved, then to persevere, knowing something greater is bound to occur in accord with the heavenly will. So if I look at Father's face, I feel such sadness that he's being treated like this. How was he? Oh, was he then about 65? Yeah, he was born 1920, so he's 64 years of age to be treated like that. But, but, he was also imprisoned, I think Mrs. Kamiyama, because he was Japanese uh, involved as well. But this are some words from Father from prison. He says, I am honored that I could serve time in Danbury to protect religious freedom, sincerely in Christ, some young moon. You know? to protect religious freedom. So what happened when he was in prison? Many religious leaders throughout America saw this was an attack on religious freedom. If he was attacked, could be put in prison, it meant anyone could. So what happened? All those people from different religions who had opposed Father stood with him for a common cause. So actually, him paying indemnity, him going to prison was not all lost. He he went that way willingly, but he actually strengthened religious freedom at that time in America. And this is the day that he's released. He was released because of his good behavior. 
and he was embraced by these uh, di different religious leaders. So he, he came out and he was victorious. But he was willing to go that path. And actually, when the, the uh, decision was given for him to go to prison, you know what he did? He walked across the court. He went to the chief prosecutor. He wanted to shake his hand. And the chief prosecutor got all embarrassed and he put his papers together and he, he walked out. Even then, he was showing he forgave him because he didn't understand what he was doing. What a heart. So how can I? This is father. Okay, this is mother. <clears throat> One challenge for us is that they do things on this huge scale. But I'm not father. I'm not. You know, we're, not we're not the same as them. And we don't have the same challenges, but we do have challenges. We are confronted by things which hurt our heart and we want to take revenge or we feel resentful. It's hard to forgive. So how do I do it? How do I do it? So now I come back to this book, Experiences with God. Ron Pavolado, in his book, he um, gives three things that he has done, which may be helpful to you and may be helpful to me. One is a forgiveness meditation. One is a forgiveness inventory. And one is a forgiveness prayer. So if any of these uh, you feel are useful and helpful, then you can use them. So first of all, a forgiveness meditation. When I was a young man, I was angry at my father because I didn't feel a lot of love from him growing up. And I thought he had been harsh with me when I was a child. I wonder if any of you have felt that when you were a child? Or your parents were a bit too harsh? Actually, my father, I would say, was harsh. He was a good father. But growing up, you know, it was difficult for him. Um, so I'll come back to that later. But um, I, so let me, he says, I tried to see my father the way I thought God saw him. I pretended that I was looking at my father as if he were my son and I was the father. I reviewed his life for, with that perspective. So again, having a parental heart. And I'd like to read a bit more of the details of his father's life. His father you know, his memories of him when he was a child is that his father was full of demeaning and frightening experiences. He had a very, uh, a very strong temper. And if it upset, if anything upset his father, he, he, he'd be quite frightening. And sometimes he was physically abusive. One time he, he, he took a, a metal coat hanger and smashed it on Ron's, uh, on, on Ron, and it broke. <laughs> Another time he wanted to hit him and his mother came in the way and hit his mother instead. But he wasn't violent all the time, but there were occasions. It was more, I think, his anger. And so I can relate to that. My father, he had a very sharp voice and it was quite frightening. Yeah. So um, also he, Ron Papaloda's father called him words like knucklehead and idiot, yeah? and. Sometimes he'd get out his belt, his leather belt, he'd hold the ends of it and he'd snap it like a whip to kind of intimidate his children. And, um, but there were times where he could be kind and generous, but the bad experiences left Ron feeling frightened and emotionally traumatized. So obviously he had resentment towards his father because of that. And I would say, also myself, because I, I felt some pain because of my father, but later I changed. Actually, when I joined the church, I could see him differently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he says here, at the age of 20, I came to a place where I wanted to love my father the way that I felt God loved me. And that's why he did this meditation. He says, my father was born in a small town in Sicily in 1922. His grandfather had goats, and my father talked about eating the fruit that grows on the prickly pear cacti. So he enjoyed a very, you know, rural life, easygoing life in Sicily. But when he was 10 years old, Ron's father, he was taken to the United States by his father. This must have been traumatic to be uprooted from his family, his friends, and the country life he was familiar with, and to be planted in New York City during the Great Depression. And uh, he hadn't been allowed to finish elementary school 
because he had to work in the family business, which was delivering beer. Yes. He sometimes had to carry a heavy containers of beer up five flights of stairs. Didn't finish elementary school. So I went, when's that? Is when you're 12, 11, 12? Yeah. So then, and also he wasn't allowed to keep the money. Although his mother gave him 10 cents so he could go to the picture show, you know, the cinema at the weekend. So when, he, when Ron realized more about his own father's childhood, his heart began to soften and he began to cry for his lost childhood. And he said, the tears washed away my anger, my bitterness, and became a healing balm to my heart. On that, and then I surrendered my grudge and I loved my father with appreciation for the sacrifices he had made to raise me. And then Ron realized that when he was the same age as his father going to America, he was going to a very good Catholic school in America, and he was playing a little league baseball at his father's expense. And his father, uh, and he thought how hard it must have been for his father uh, with little education to raise six children. And also he was a, a World War II combat veteran. And he had two purple hearts, a bronze star and a silver star for his, his, his service, military service. And now Ron sees him as his hero. So our perspective on people, if we don't understand their heart, we don't understand what's behind them, why they behave the way they do, it's so easy to judge them. And this is what I, I just read. So it's the same with a relationship, you know. My, my wife is Swedish and I'm English. So I, I, I perceive through my English eyes, she perceives me through her, her Swedish eyes. I'm a man and she's a woman, you know. And so mis the misunderstanding, but I think over the years, we learn to understand each other better, learn about her background, learn about my background. And the same with my father, you know. Um, there was a time when I was, before I joined the church, where I really struggled because my father, I felt I couldn't express an opinion. If, or if my opinion was different, he would get upset easily. But he was under strain because his wife, his wife was um, mentally ill. He was working full time as a teacher. He was under strain. And sometimes he kind of let, let rip. And, um, and he wasn't very embracing, like physically. My mother was, yeah. But, um, you know, when you get older, you think, well, he did the best he could. My mother did the best she could. So now, when I joined the church, and I understand this thing about living for the sake of others, whenever I visited my family, and I tried to do that as much as I could, I just was there to serve and to listen, to listen to my father. He talked about the war, and, this, and he needed someone to talk to because his wife was not that kind of person. When he was um, when he was young, he he almost died at the age ten. He got some um, sickness which could cause like brain damage, but he survived. Um, he became an electrician. He lost his job. His family had no money. They had to kind of sell things off. In desperation, he joined the army. You know, he suffered a lot. So my compassion for him developed. But also later in life, I could see. Being a Christian, he had a very good heart. But when you're a child, you don't see that. That's why, you know, we, we should look at our parents. We, we, we should forgive them. <laughs> we should have compassion for them. So secondly, uh, this is another idea which I tried. I think is, it can be helpful. He says this, review your life. Make a list of all the people who have hurt you in any way. Or those, those who you feel you cannot give your love. You're withholding your love. Write down the names of those who you've already forgiven because maybe you've forgiven them, but maybe on a deeper level, you're still harboring some kind of resentment. So sometimes it's good to kind of go back and review what happened and even put your own name down. Because if you've made mistakes, can you forgive yourself? And one by one, say a prayer for the people on your list. So this is a prayer he, he gave. He says this, Dear Heavenly Father, Mother God, I'm praying for forgiveness for the boy who bullied me and called me stupid when I was six years old. I know it was a long time ago now, but I, 
But now that I think about it, it really hurt my heart at the time. And there is still pain there. It made me feel that there was something wrong with me, which made me doubt my value and question whether or not I was lovable and loved. Please forgive him, heavenly parent, and please help me forgive him too. So this is like an example of something happened in the past that maybe is unresolved and to try, try to have a parental heart towards this person. As an adult, I realize now that his bullying of me was a really, really a symptom of his own insecurity, which means that his heart was suffering. I pray that he's, he, he's healed from any injury to his heart that he has suffered. I pray for him to find happiness, peace, and fulfillment from this day forward. Amen. So this is an example. But what happens if you can't forgive someone? You feel you can't. So here's a prayer, a suggested prayer, if you can't. Dear Heavenly Father, Mother God, I honestly don't feel like forgiving this person on the list. What this person did to me was so extreme that I just don't feel any compassion for them at all. Yet I know that you can forgive them and I want to be healed of my own pain. Please help me. Please help me, my heart to open. Help me to see this person with your eyes so that I can gain a forgiving heart and find healing both for myself and for this person. Amen. So now I'm coming to the conclusion. So in the beginning, I'm talking about experiences with God. So I mentioned mother talks in order to have a relationship to God, we need to understand God's nature, the reality of God's love and how to live in that love. And so these were the aspects I came up with. God of heart and love, masculine, feminine, heavenly parent. Love exists in a relationship, parental love, unconditional, sacrificial, and changing eternal. And we need to open our heart to God's love and live for the sake of others. So some final thoughts from mother. So these two aspects, open your heart to God's love, live for, other, for the sake of others. This is what I, she says in relationship to these two things. The capacity to forgive requires that we eliminate the resentment and anger in our hearts and see in see God in the face of our enemy, a parental heart. That's what we need to do. Open our heart, find within ourselves, you know, how does God feel towards this person? Can I see this person with God's eyes to, to allow, because God loves this person. And secondly, live for the sake of others. To find true happiness, we need to practice true love. True love means living for the sake of others, serving others, not being served. True love means to forgive endlessly. Not just forgive 70 times seven, like Jesus said, but endlessly. And with those final thoughts, I'd like to finish. Thank you for listening.